Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much to Professor Jin for inviting me to be here. It's my first stay in uh, Korea and I enjoyed it very much. Very dynamic country and uh, I will certainly come back if I have the occasion. So, for such a wide audience I will start with something a little bit easier and we come up to the end, to the quantum stuff. So, what is a braid for a topologist? For the topologist, a braid is just a special case of a tangle. Example that one. So you have a cube, so you have to look at this from the side, it will look like that, with some projection, and from one face to the other face they have embedded arcs. Smoothly embedded and we assume oriented too. And uh, we can study such objects, go to the boundary, up to isotopy which fixes these endpoints. So this is some topological object. To study embeddings of uh, arcs into a, a three-dimensional cube up to isotopy which fixes the endpoints. So what is a braid? A braid is a very special case. If you consider the projection onto this coordinate, it should be without singularities. So let me a braid. <laughs> Say that one. Oh, that's a braid. <laughs> you see there are no singularities for this projection. So everybody knows the braid group here, I guess. The braid group Bn with a generator sigma 1 up to sigma n minus 1. So generators just, if you number these lines, the first one would be that one. You could make just such a twist and nothing at the other. So then you could uh, make a twist and between these two strands and so on. And the famous braid relation Well, this braid relation just corresponds to what is called for in the topological context to a Reidemeister move. So just if we make an isotopy of this diagram, it can happen that at some moment we have that and we move this branch to that. Oh, I should draw it more horizontally. <laughs> oh, let's say that. And we move it to that. So here we have one negative crossing now, don't worry. You can have here signs, some minor signs in it. So such a move, evidently this is an isotopy, this just corresponds to this relation in the braid group. And there is also uh, some commutative relation which means that if we have one crossing here, one here, we can push them. It doesn't change anything with the diagram, so we don't care about that. And of course we could add into two strands two new crossings which, which come like that and which could be cancelled out again. This is just in the braid what would be we add sigma 1, sigma inverse or sigma 1 inverse sigma 1. Okay. Okay. So if we have a braid, uh, let's close it. What does it mean closing a braid? So we have this cube and we will identify this face with this face. We glue it. Because the endpoints here are the same as the endpoints here. So our braid will close to what is called a link. If we assume a special condition that the permutation induced by these uh, uh, by these points is a cycle in, this, in the symmetric group, uh, this uh, closure will give a knot. We will always consider this case. So we assume beta NBN induces a cyclic fermentation. Of its endpoints. Okay. So if we close it now, it will live in a solid torus. I throw the solid torus. I draw it like that. So we look from above on the solid torus. And we have our braid in it, our closed braid. Say, for example, that one. So that is a three braid. We have three strands. It closes to a knot. You see, the braid was here. Oops. This is our braid, and then we just close it. This, we could shrink this just to this closure. This is just a closed braid. So it's a knot and the solid torus. We will note it like that. Better. 
comes to beta hat, this is a closed break, which is a knot, and it lives in the solid torus. It's d2 times s1. Okay. So, if we have a knot in the solid torus, first question is, uh, uh, is it a closed braid? That's a very difficult question. One cannot answer that question. There's no algorithm which decides whether we have a knot in the solid torus. You can bring it to a closed braid. So, that's, that's a difficult thing. For example, you can make, assume you have a closed braid, and you make a thing like that. As a tangle, if I have drawn there, at the beginning, So, uh, the rest is a closed braid. You just spoil it with that. Then one can prove it will no longer be a closed braid. What, uh, whatever braid you take, closed braid, it will not be isotopic to this one. And this is done with some invariants which are called Gauss uh, diagram invariants. And um, uh, I will not introduce these invariants, but I will go one step higher. So, let me uh, remind, uh, explain to you what is a Gauss diagram. So Gauss diagram of a knot. Not in the solid torus. So after all, we have a knot, so it is a circle. It's an embedding of a circle which is oriented. Our knot is oriented. So we take this circle which parameters our knot. For example, this circle parameters this blue line. And whenever we go along this, and whenever we have a crossing, so it means two points have to be connected. So, for example, let's go along this one. So we are at st this starting point, this is our starting point. We go along the orientation, so we come to the first crossing, to this one. So we made some overcross here. We, will, we make errors to this, uh, to this, we attach errors to this circle which connects the overcross with the undercross of a crossing. So if we have a crossing, so this here is the undercross, and this is the overcross, evidently. So we come to the overcross, then we come to the overcross of a second crossing. Oh, I should not... Let me make the starting point here. <laughs> to make it more aesthetic. So we had overcross of the first one, then we come the overcross of the second one. So we continue, we come to the undercross of the second one. So this arrow will be already there. And then we continue and we come to the undercross of this one. And we come again to our starting point. So, so there are just two arrows, they will not cross in this case. And moreover, for each crossing we can uh, define a sign. The sign uh, corresponds exactly in the braid group. We have a generator order, in it's inverse. So the sign of a crossing is that. If the crossing is like that, so we say it's positive, uh, we, it's plus one. And if it's like that, we say it's negative, minus. So we just uh, write the sign. So this would correspond to a generator sigma i, this would correspond to a generator sigma i inverse. Okay. So we put uh, moreover these signs on these uh, crossings. You see this one is a positive one, this one is a positive one. So it's plus and plus. Moreover, if we have such a crossing, we could consider if, if we come from the undercross, we go to the overcross and we continue. It will give us a loop. So here in this case, for this crossing, it would be that. We come from here, we go to the overcross, we come back. And we count the winding number in the solid torus. Another expression for this is the homology class in the first homology of the uh, solid torus. Uh, never mind. You see, it goes around this hole in the solid torus. And we count how many times it will go around this hole. So here it will go around once. So we will write to this one, one. Uh, or I will write it here. <laughs> Up. <laughs> and this one, if we take this one, if we make it here, let me take another color. So it goes around once, it continues. Oh. <laughs> it goes around twice. You see, the, the yellow line uh, makes two, uh, two uh, complete uh, rotations uh, uh, 
on this whole. So that would be a two. For this one. And this is the Gauss diagram, called the Gauss diagram of this uh, of this uh, object, of this uh, knot, or in this case closed braid. Okay? So what we will construct are uh, uh, Gauss diagram uh, uh, code cycles. So we will construct Gauss diagram invariance for one parameter families of diagrams. Um, invariance for one parameter families. Diagrams of close braids. We restrict here just to close braid. So what does it mean? So I consider the space of if I have beta a close braid, I can consider the space of all close braids which are isotopic to beta. This is called the topological moduli space. Space of all close braids. Isotopic to better. Uh, okay. And I consider uh, an arc in the space. So S and M beta. A generic oriented arc. So what will I see in this arc? There will be usually diagrams, but a finite number of times there will be a diagram that is more special which will have exactly a braid relation in it. We, sometimes we will use a braid relation, so it means a uh, Reidemeister move. So, that another word to say, the triple crossing. So in our diagram, at some moment, we will see in the projection that three branches will cross at one point. It's easy to see, before it was like that. So it came here, I draw only the planar picture, then it becomes that. And then it moves on. It's here. So this is exactly the braid relation. Okay? And we will associate something each time this happens. So what will we associate? Uh, I will keep this picture. <laughs> or perhaps not. So if we have such, such an event, a braid relation, so let's consider the Gauss diagram. How does it look in this case? In this case, there will be three points which are projected to the same point in the plane. So there will be a triangle, three uh, arrows which come together to form a triangle. So there could be two sorts of triangle. It could be like that, or it could be like that. Okay, so orientation of the circle is always like that. And more, we don't care in this case about the signs of that, uh, but we care about uh, these, uh, these markings or these winding numbers. If I consider the special case n equal to 3, so the winding numbers are determined by that. Uh, where, where comes this from? Because you see, if we have a closed braid, and uh, then and you smooth some crossings, then uh, each uh, loop which will be obtained will go around at least once positively. So all these winding numbers have to be positive. So there's only one uh, possibility which we could have. This is a 1, this is a 2, this is a 2. So in this case, this is a 1, this is a 2, this is a 1. No, for three braids there's no ambiguity. Because each this loop has to go once around, you see, this will be a 1, this will be a 1, this will be a 1. So if you take this one on this side, it will be a 1 plus a 1, it's a 2. No? So they are completely determined by the errors in this case. And we will consider, if we have such a move, you see, we could come from this side to this side, or we could go the other side. So there will be a sign. Each move has a sign. So it's a little bit uh, too uh, complicated to explain. We just consider these three crossings on, this, on, uh, on such a diagram before 
and after. It will on one side always look like that, on the other side like that. And we say the positive direction is that one. So this is a sign of our triple crossing in this one parameter family. And then we consider the following thing. So definition. So gamma one of our closed braid, I write a little two here, I'll explain later why, uh, of S is what? It is a sum over all uh, triple crossings in S. Okay. The sign of this triple crossing times times what? So I will write it here. Times uh, the sum uh, over all um, errors which I see. So this is my triple crossing. And the triple crossing has to be like that. Only that type. And I consider here errors which goes like that. So I call it P. <laughs> yeah, take here uh, the rise of P. Okay, I, I consider, I look at my Gauss diagram with the special triangle, and I look how many errors I have which go from here to here, and uh, I take each time it's sign of the error, it's a plus or a minus, and I take minus the sum of, of that thing. I look again in the Gauss diagram. Here it's the same, and the error is now like that, P prime, V P prime. Okay, such such an expression. So I look at my uh, yeah, uh, just a sum of uh, uh, all these triple points, and to each triple point, I associate this sum, where this here is uh, always the right of this of this crossing. So it turns out uh, this is what is called a code cycle. That's a theorem. So gamma two uh, beta two is a code cycle. It's a one code cycle. So that means if I take uh, a loop and I take another loop uh, which is uh, homologous to this loop, or say homotopic if you know that better, then the value of that should be the same. Okay. So if if I want now associate something to a braid. So this is not associated to braid or to closed braid, it's associated to one parameter family. So I have to find one parameter families of closed braids. So where comes this from? So let's consider our closed braid again. Oh, no, okay, I will draw it again. Uh, so let, let's like, take this one. So this is our closed braid in the solid torus. So This is our solid torus, where it lives, okay? So there are two natural loops. What can we do? On one loop, let's call it rotation by phi. As we make the rotation around this axis by 2 phi, a complete rotation. And there's a second loop, as this one. Let's call it rot xi, where we make the rotation around z. So if I draw the solid torus more realistically, so there's one loop, you can make a rotation like that, or one you can make a rotation like that, because um, solid torus is class S1 times T2, so there are two S1 parameter families. Okay, you make this rotation or you make this rotation. So what do we see? We see if we make this rotation, uh, no events at all, because it's just the rotation of the diagram. So it's the same diagram, it looks exactly the same, we just rotate it like that. So we know the value of our thing will be always zero on that. So we know, evidently, gamma 2, beta 2 on rot uh, phi zero for each beta. 
Oh, yeah. And um, uh, what's, what's about the other loop? So the other loop has a very nice uh, description in, uh, in the braid group. So description of what psi. Uh, so I have my braid and I make, uh, uh, I uh, create the full twist and its inverse. So what is the full twist in the braid group? The full twist is just the following thing. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> so it goes better like that. So assume uh, you take a trivial end braid, looks like that, on a band. And now you make a full twist of this band. So, your strings on this will go around. This is a full twist in the break group. It's called a Garside's element, delta square. And so we create this just delta square, delta square inverse by Rademeister 2. And then, so let, oh, it's, I started with beta square, beta. How do you make that? So you have beta, you create that. Now you push this delta square because we are on the solid torus on the other side. So here this was your thing, here you have delta minus 2, here you have delta 2, and you push it here just by an isotopy to that. Nothing happens. Just you slide it along to that. So it comes to that. So up to now there weren't events which count for us. Okay. Now you push delta square through this braid. Well, that looks like that. Square beta. And now you eliminate 2 by 2 delta minus two, uh, uh, delta 2 and you come back to beta. So this is a loop. It starts with beta, it ends with beta. And this loop corresponds exactly around the rotation of the, the soul of the solid torus. Okay, so let, let us make it in a special case for one three braid to see it. So let's consider the three braid sigma one, sigma two inverse in B3. So I will write things, uh, so it's quite uh, too heavy to write like that. I write this is a one and this is a two bar. This means sigma 1, this means sigma 2 uh, inverse. So, so what we have, we have 1, 2 bar. I will not write the delta minus 2. So, uh, here we have delta minus 2, I don't care. Then we have 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. This is delta square in this case. You easily see that. It's a full twist. Okay, we have to push it through. So let's make, we make here a braid relation. So it comes to 1, uh, 1, 2, 1 bar, okay? So here we have 1 bar 1, we can eliminate it and uh, recreate it in the, other, in the other order. So it comes to 1, 1, 2, 1, 1 bar, 2, 1, 2, okay? So this, this move, this counts for us. So now, next one, we take that one. So this comes to 1, 1, 2, 1, then it will be 2, 1, 2 bar, 2. We make it again, 2 bar, 2, we can exchange it. Next 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 2 bar. Okay, then we make this one. We get 1, 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2 bar. And it remains to make that one. 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2 bar. And you see, up. Really, we have delta square now in front of it. Yeah, we pushed it through. And there are exactly four events which happened. So this one, this one, this one, and this one. So we have to believe me, two of them are of this type. Two of them are... You just have to draw of this type and two are of this type. And of course, they enter one with sine plus, one with sine minus. So, 
let me tell you which one enters and we will calculate our the value of our one could cycle for on the spread <laughs> That we have one. Then I, I have uh, the delta, the delta minus two in front of it. I can push it on the other side, just behind it, and simplify. So the braid becomes much shorter. And there are just uh, two cases. There are just this one, one bar two one, and it remains one bar. And the other one is this one, one two one, and makes one bar, one bar two, two bar. You can verify that at home. From, from this uh, from these lines, so uh, now we have to draw it. So this is a one bar. Then we have a two. Then we have a one. Then we have a one bar. This is our move here. Okay, we close it. Oh, so this is one. Yo, so, so let's uh, draw the Gauss diagram. So we have the triangle, which is really because the overcross, then we come to the, the, the undercross, and then we come to the branch which passes between the two strands. Hmm? That will be uh, that one. So we, there's only one crossing. So let's uh, put this crossing on the picture. We have the overcross, we come to an overcross of this thing. We continue, we go under, so we are, have passed this point, we come to the undercross of this crossing. Hop. And it's a minus. Okay. The sign of this is determined by what? We follow this orientation here at this point, it comes back to this point. This means the sign is a minus. So the contribution of this thing to our invariant will be minus, minus one. Okay, let's consider now the second case. So let me have to draw it. So it's one, two, one. So this is our move. Then we have one bar, one bar, two bar. Okay, so let's go give names to these crossings, A, B, C, and we will draw the Gauss diagram. So if we are over it, we come under it, it's okay. It's of this type which we need. So the sign, if you see, will be here now, it comes not to the same crossing, but it comes in there. So the sign will be a plus. And uh, let's uh, draw the crossings. So we are over, we come to A over. It's A. Then we come to B under. That's B. We continue. We come to the undercross, to so that point. We come to C under. We continue, we come to the middle, we have already passed that point. We come to A uh, under, then we come to B over, and then we come to C over. Oh, I ri erased the invariant, I guess. Yeah, that's not fine. The invariant was like that. Z minus Z. Okay, the rise of this cross. So which which uh, error will count? Uh, so we don't we don't have any error of this one. We have just one error B, which is of this type. So this error B has a minus. Here all crossings are negative, but it enters with a minus. So we have plus. Minus minus one makes plus one. And our invariant, this is of course of plus one two. 
So iron weld is equal to plus 2. So we have calculated that gamma 2 sigma 1 oh, sigma 2 minus 1 2 of root xi equal plus 2. So what does it mean? Uh, by the way, we could have done, we couldn't generalize it, can be generalized for arbitrary degree, we have to make more decorations. So let me just give you the formula for n equal 4, it becomes a bit more complicated. For n equal 4, it would be that. We have to put decorations. So I will only make this chord, this are only like this. This is always like this. So here's a 1, a 2, a 3. Here's a 1. Plus, uh, same uh, procedure as uh, before. I just made the configuration. So that will be now. You have to take the sum over all triple crossings of the sign. And each time you have to take the sum of all rights of this crossing. So here the configuration will be that. Uh, this is always the same here. Yeah? One, two, three, always the same triangle, but it's like that. Uh, one goes two plus same triangle. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Now it is here. And just one minus. One, two, three. And the so minus is like that again. That's a one. That's a one, two. Okay, that's a one code cycle for n equal four. And one can generalize it for all n. Moreover, I can add more errors in the same picture, so that but with the formulas become longer and longer. And um, example. This um, I will not calculate it. If we calculate uh, gamma 1 of this braid, sigma 1, sigma 2 minus 1, sigma 3 minus 1 of root C, that will be equal to minus 1. Again, so it's not 0 for that one. So what does it mean? So assume Assume here that you have a torus knot. That your closed braid is a torus knot. So let me draw it. Oh, it usually it's drawn like that. I'll take another color. So and then I go on there. Good. Oh, the, you see the red one? This is, uh, this is a trefoil which is put on a torus. You can put a trefoil on a torus. This is called a torus knot. Not all knots can be put on a torus. It's very rare. You see the torus knot. And let's consider what our two rotations do to it. So we had that rotation and, and that rotation. Okay, so if this is a PQ torus knot, Not. You see that if you take p times one rotation, it will be exactly q times the other rotation. p times rot phi, say it's q times rot uh, xi. So if you make this rotation, it's the same thing as making that, just as uh, the speed is different. This is what you use if you calculate the fundamental group of the complement using one Compton theorem. That's exactly that. So that means these two loops, they are dependent over the rationals. So we see uh, this one is P sur Q times uh, root phi. You could write it like that. Root C, so P sur Q, yeah, root phi. So another word to say, uh, so in the scientific language, that would say that
that root phi and root xi are linearly dependent in the first homology of this topological model space with rational coefficients. Okay. And Hatcher has proven that the inverse is true too. Even in much more generality. Assume that you have a, a knot in the solid torus which is not contained in a small three ball. And V not contained in a three ball. So it should go around the hole somehow. It should go around, come back, but it should. You cannot put it in a small three ball. And assume that uh, these two loops are linearly dependent. If root phi k and root xi k are linearly dependent. Then uh, you are exactly in the situation. Your knot is a torus knot, uh, so it is the closure of a braid. Then K is a torus knot with respect to the boundary of our solid torus. So this is a torus and it lies on this torus, a little bit pushed inside. So what does that mean? So let's consider braids again. So braids, uh, you can consider a braid uh, from a completely different viewpoint. You can consider it as meant in a mapping class group. So a braid beta Bn is an element in the mapping class group. M uh, zero one n. So that means, what is the mapping class group? These are the diffeomorphisms of the disk, which fix the boundary and which brings n punctures to n punctures. So that is diff uh, preserving the orientation. Uh, in any case, it has uh, of d two, uh, d d two. So it means this identity on the boundary and uh, uh, permitting perhaps endpoints, bringing endpoints to themselves, perhaps and permitting them. Modulo isotopy. So this, this is the same as a braid, how to see that? Each uh, uh, homeomorphism of the, of the disk, which is the identity on the boundary, by all theorem of Alexander is uh, isotopic to the identity. So just take this isotopy. We take this isotopy and we look what will happen with the punctures. They will move. If we do that, okay, uh, the move they which will make is exactly the braid. And they come again back. Okay. So th this is the geometric braid comes from the isotopy of this uh, disk which can always be related to the identity, because the contractible space. So, so this is a geometric braid. So but, uh, braid is a diffeomorphism of the punctured disk. So it's a diffeomorphism of the surface, and we have, in general, the nielsen thurston classification of that. So what does it say? It's a particular case of the nielsen thurston classification. Morphisms of the surface. So there are two types. So beta could be reducible. Reducible, what does that, that mean? It, in this geometric language, that would mean we have tubes which form a braid.
You see these tubes, they form a braid. And inside each tube, you have a non trivial braid. Oh, up. So you can split your braid in several braids, and these splitting, they are also uh, a braid. So that, that's a reducible braid. So all oh, yeah, they are periodic. Periodic. What does that mean? That means if you take the exist k and l to natural numbers, such that you if you take b better to the power of k, so it's equal to the full twist to the power of l. So it's a multiple of the full twist. So this is comes because we fix the boundary. Here. If we allow, if we push and model the full twist, it means better of k is uh, identity. Okay. So this means some multiple of your braid is just a full twist. Example, take the braid sigma 1, sigma 2, and B3. So if we take this to the power of 3, we get the delta square. So this is a periodic braid. Yeah? So in the third class, there are all the braid which remains. They are called pseudanosov. But that could be pseudonymous. So one can say something about pseudonymous of braids. So there exist uh, two transverse invariant invariant under the diffeomorphism beta uh, measured singular. Usually, people drop the word singular foliations. Only two. So, uh, typically, it looks like that. So, we have some singularity, and you have one foliation, and you have a, a, a transverse foliation. Okay, and there's a measure. So they, these foliations are invariant, but on one of them, uh, beta acts as a, a expansion by some factor, the same factor for all leaves, and on the other by some contraction. So there's an expanding factor. Factor lambda beta, so it's bigger than one, and a contracting factor. So it's just 1 over lambda beta, which is evidently smaller than 1 then. Okay? So these, these are very interesting things, lambda beta. It's very difficult to calculate. So, if, what, let's consider the case periodic braid. So, it's, if you take the punctures, so you have your disk, and you take a smaller circle, and you take your punctures uh, as a vertices if you have an n braid of a regular n goal. For an n braid, some vertices of a regular n goal. n goal around the, the center of this disk. So y you could make a rotation. Just here, we have the rotation by 2p over n. To up to some power, up to some power p. So here, so it'd be 2p over 3, you can make it several times. And it's known that rate is periodic if and only if it is conjugate to such a rotation. So, known beta is periodic. If and only if beta is conjugate to rotation around the center of the disk. Okay. 
So I have forgotten to say, conjugation of braids is exactly the same as isotopy of closed braids in the solid torus. No, that's also known. known. Conjugation of braids. That's equivalent as uh, uh, closed braids isotopy classes. of close braids in the solid torus even as, as knots okay if you have a close braid in the solid torus you could make all isotopies where it stays a close braid but you could make more fancy isotopies it could go around it stays no longer a close braid at some moment but it turns out the result is the same it's the same if you find an isotopy, whatever, you will find one which stays within the class of closed braids. So that's a non-trivial result, but this is well known. So what does it mean for a periodic braid? So if we close it, we know it's just the rotation. So it stays on this circle, and we have closed it, so it's a torus knot. It's just a torus knot. This shows that uh, the closure of a periodic braid is always a torus knot. And the inverse, of course. So we have said beta is periodic. That's of course well known. If and only if that is a torus knot. So now we come back to our invariance. So we have we had calculated that gamma. Uh, one uh, sigma one, but two minus one two uh, of what? Xi it was plus two, and we have already seen that if it is a torus knot, then it should be zero, because uh, for torus knots there are two loops where uh, linearly dependent, and the other loop always gives zero. So if sigma one sigma two minus one is a torus knot. Then uh, this gamma is, is two is also zero. What C is zero. Otherwise, we have proven that this is not a torus node. Otherwise, we have proven it's not a periodic braid. It's easily seen that it's not a reducible braid. It uh, simply has not enough crossings. But in any case, there are fast algorithms to decide whether a braid is reducible. <laughs> and um, so we know that it's Pseudanosov. Our invariant has proven that this braid is a pseudonymous of braid. So gamma one and non-zero. Uh, so pseudonymous of or reducible. So sometimes it's evidently not reducible. So pseudonymous of. By the way, the same thing happened for, for the other one, which I, I told you, uh, the sigma 1, sigma 2, minus 1, sigma 3, minus 1. It was minus 1, so it's also so also. So what does it tell us? Uh, yeah, what are these, uh, uh, these um, Gauss uh, diagram one code cycles? These are what one could call um, finite type one code cycles. So I don't know. let me just formulate that. A Gauss diagram, one code cycle, uh, which uses uh, just uh, uh, d, d errors, d errors. So, how many errors we have used? We have the triangle plus uh, additional error. So, this is a finite type. One code cycle, code cycle of degree d minus two. So I will not define what it does it mean. Uh, it's uh, uh, really very. You have probably seen, or some of you, what is a finite type invariant of a knot. 
So that, that's easy to explain. So more or less it means that you can calculate it in polynomial time with respect to the number of crossings. Uh, here it's the same thing. You can this uh, calculate in polynomial time with respect to the number of crossings. So uh, the degree of uh, the calculation is just the degree of the invariant. That's more or less the same thing. It has another completely different definition, but comes to that. So the idea is, you see, these uh, finite type uh, one code cycles, they contain information about the geometry of the braid. So we can detect that the braid is pseudo-Nosov. So there are the, these, uh, these braids, they have other invariants, they have these geometric invariants. For example, the, the factor, the contraction factor, and another invariant is you can close the braid. Yeah, by the way, uh, this uh, classification of uh, braids, it was well known. And so this is classification of conjugate classes. It doesn't change under conjugacy. So in reality, these are conjugacy invariants of the braid. And so if you take the closed braid and you add the axis of the solid torus, so this is a link in the C-sphere. Okay, so we had here our braid. Say so it was like that. And we had this axis. So we consider that. This is the same thing as the mapping torus of beta. If you, bet, if you uh, look at beta as a, a diffeomorphism, you can consider the mapping torus. So we have this disk. You take the, the plan cylinder and you glue it, this disk, to this disk with, with beta. So if you make that, you see it's exactly the component of this axis in S3. And Thurston has proven that the complement of this link the geometry is exactly the geometry of the conjugate class of the braid. This is just. It tells you that uh, geometry of S3 minus beta union axis is in one one correspondence are like the geometry of beta. So it means uh, beta has to the of if and only if this manifold is hyperbolic. It means it has a complete metric of constant negative uh, sectional curvature minus one. And it is uh, periodic if and only this is ciphered fibered. It is reducible if and only if you have uh, irreducible tori in the complement of your. This uh, corresponds exactly. But uh, say the pseudo of case, you have the hyperbolic volume of this manifold. And nobody knows how lambda beta is related to the hyperbolic volume. If you ask specialists, they always say there is no relation. But if you consider these two braids for which I have calculated that, one is known that uh, between all pseudonos of braids of, of uh, three strands or four strands, they have the smallest lambda beta. And the volume is the smallest two. So there should be a relation. People just don't know and they say there isn't a relation. So it has to be find the relation. Okay. So, so we have done something with these uh, finite type one code cycles, but it's just a number, and we would final geometric information. So we have to calculate lots of such cycles and how to combine this information to give something. So let me tell you a little bit about quantum invariance. So what is a quantum invariant? Uh, I will not give you the definition, that is just an invariant which comes from an irreducible representation of a quantum group associated to some complex simple Lie algebra. Okay, so they all verify scan relations. So what is a scan relation? You can take this as definition of a quantum invariant. The, the famous most famous one is the Homefly one. We have always to add PT for Pritzky Tracik, we are in Poland. We found the same thing, but uh, <laughs> Mail was so slow from Poland, so they were ignored at the beginning. No, now they are added. <laughs> and um, uh, the scan relation is the following. You take just one crossing of your knot. It works in general for knots, uh, links arbitrary, not only braids. That's a positive crossing. You replace it by a negative one. You change just its crossing, and it should set some new variable times if you smooth it. And if you have something like that, then there's another new variable times that. And you come down to some basic elements. The basic elements depend on the context. If we have knots in three space, it comes down to one. And if you have uh, tangles, 
uh, that comes down, or braids that comes down to the permutation braids, just the generators of the Hecker algebra. If you have closed braids, it comes just down to homology classes of the tools. So uh, it depends. But this is the relation. So outside, all pictures are the same. This is in a small ball. And you just replace it in the small ball. And then you calculate. You can recursively calculate your invariant. Of course, it's the difficult thing is to prove that it's correct. It does not depend in which order, which crossing you will change. So there is something non-trivial to prove that it's invariant. So this is a quantum invariant. So here in our case, it will be a polynomial in that v. They take, for simplicity, take a, a loop. Take a knot and C space. So there is a well-known uh, procedure how to get finite type invariants out of that. So this is a quantum invariant. And we want to get finite types. So we make just a substitution. We say this is e to the power of t over 2 minus, uh, uh, no, uh, what is the substitution? Minus, uh, yeah, it's here. We have a minus t over 2. Okay. And v is e to the power n plus 1 times t over 2 for each n natural number. And we make a power series extension. So it's calculus. And it comes down for each n. We end up with an with a infinite series, uh, e in the, uh, in, the, in the integers, or in that, yeah. Uh, of, uh, no, in, uh, in n. Of course, of some coefficients a, e, which are rational, times t to the power of e. And um, it's not very difficult to prove that, well known, that each of these AE is a finite type invariant of degree at most E. For each E, AE is a finite type invariant of degree. So for knots in three space, you can uh, assume that it means it's a Gauss diagram invariant of degree uh, at most e. It's proven by Gozarov that in three space it's the same thing. In the solid torus, nobody knows, but probably it's the same thing, but it's not proven. So it means these finite type invariants, you get them from quantum invariants, lots of them. It's a way to organize these finite type invariants, uh, to get uh, not polynomials. And the natural idea now is, of course, what about our uh, finite type 1 code cycles? Can we organize them as, uh, as quantum code cycles? So this is uh, the project. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, so, oh. <laughs> project. Find quantum 1 code cycles. Uh, such that uh, developed <coughs> to uh, a finite type one could cycle. Why, why would this be a good thing? Uh, it would be a good thing um, because um, you know, uh, at some, in some very nice cases, for example, this lambda beta. You can get it out from a quantum invariant. You can get it out from a quantum invariant exactly if this transverse, if these foliations there are transversely orientable. I will not define what that means. That means that it's exactly the case when some occurrence matter, the norm of some occurrence matter is multiplicative. So if the problem becomes multiplicative, quantum invariants are multiplicative, they solve the problem. This will be the greatest real root of the two variable Alexander polynomial at some place. So in general, this matrix is not multiplicative, so quantum invariants don't solve the problem. So if we have non-multiplicative quantum invariants, you have a chance that perhaps you will get out everything from these invariants. So I have constructed such a quantum uh, one code cycle. It's called R plus. So it, it's a quantum code cycle which lives for arbitrary tangles in this, uh, this space, modular space of tangles, and it has values in some 
rather complicated big object, uh, the Reidemeister scale model of something with polynomial coefficients of uh, many variables. So I've gave uh, lectures all the week long about this, so I have no time to rem remember that, I uh, recall that. And unfortunately on this loop it's zero. That's no luck. <laughs> A plus of uh, rot uh, C for cross point is always zero. So we are not yet there. But uh, it gives something for braids. Instead of applying it to closed braids, I can apply it to braids. And it gives an obstruction to that the braid, we can prove that if uh, beta is, a, if we have a braid beta, we take, so what, C of beta. I have not defined what that would be for a braid. Uh, if beta is isotopic to a rotation, of the disk disk, then this is zero okay so we can detect that the braid is not isotopic to the rotation of a disk let me just give an example and let's stop there <laughs> so let's consider the following braid sigma 1, sigma 2 so you can write it as that. You can write it as sigma 1 power 3, sigma 2 times sigma 2 power minus 1, sigma 1 times sigma 1 or minus 3, sigma 2. Okay? I just wrote this braid like that. So it turns out this is evidently a rotation. It's rotation by 2p over 3. This to the power of 3 is just, it's just a rotation. So we know r plus for this one is 0. So this is a periodic braid, uh, make that as exercises at home. The sum power of this to the power of 2 will be uh, the same thing as delta square. So this is periodic. Now so this is Pseudonosov and this too. So we know if we calculate a plus of this one, it will be 0. And we calculate a plus of this one, it's non-zero non-zero, it's non-zero. So first thing it tells us, we can, uh, uh, we can find out that the periodic braid is not, uh, it's not uh, isotopic to rotation. It's always conjugate to rotation, but not isotopic. And these two are not isotopic. Of course, they are even not periodic. They couldn't, uh, but we find it also. And secondly, it tells us that uh, our invariant L plus is not multiplicative, because the values are in some model which is torsion free. So if we have three things which are not zero in a torsion-free model, the, the product will be non-zero. But here it is zero. And thirdly, it tells us that with the usual quantum invariant, without taking one code cycles, you can never get this because they are multiplicative. So if these three are non-zero, here we have something non-zero. So it tells us three things. So I, I have to stop here. So thank you for your patience. <laughs>